Why have any other dinner roll when you can have these? Less. You're ever. <laughs> no. Mm -hmm. I'll sell this recipe to anyone for like six million dollars. I can just watch the video. <laughs> <laughs> oh damn it! Or buy the book. I'll sell it to them for thirty-five dollars <laughs> MSRP. Hey everyone, I'm Claire Saffitz. Welcome to my home kitchen. Today I'm showing you a real fan favorite recipe from Dessert Person. It's my sour cream and chive dinner rolls and it is the most buttery, pillowy, pull apart, light, delicious dinner roll you could ever possibly make. Here's the thing, I feel like dinner rolls, not just like the bread you get at restaurants, but like specifically a dinner roll, they're not as good as I want them to be. So the point of this recipe was to develop a dinner roll that was like the thing I wanted to eat most on the table. They're pull apart, they're very soft and pillowy, they have a little bit of slight savory flavor from chives, they're really rich from sour cream, but they're so, so light and delicious. And the key to it is this technique of making this sort of style of roux, the term for it is tong zhang. The technique allows the bread to retain a lot of moisture and keeps it very soft and pillowy. You could make like incredibly delicious little sliders on them, but I don't even like really even wanna put butter on it. It's just so good on its own. This is a soft dough, so I use my stand mixer with the hook attachment to put it together. You could do it by hand if you had like an extreme amount of patience and arm strength. I have a 13 by nine pan for baking them. This does make like a pretty large volume of rolls, so it's great for a crowd. And then in terms of ingredients, I'm using bread flour, that's important. We want bread flour that has a lot of protein because that is going to help create this really like pull apart, almost thread-like texture in the roll. Whole milk, sour cream, three large eggs, kosher salt, sugar. They're not sweet, but the sugar is an important ingredient. It really brings out the flavor and balances it out. Unsalted butter, active dry yeast, and chives. And then I top it off with a little flaky salt and black pepper. I just wanna say this has one of the my favorite photos in the book, which is, when I talk about that kind of thready texture, that's what I'm talking about, that pull apart, really soft, like almost silky kind of crumb. So I'm taking the flour, a half cup milk, and I'm also gonna add a half cup of water. I'm gonna add the flour. And then the general rule of thumb is like, you go wet into dry rather than dry into wet. That helps to prevent lumps. So I'm gonna just slowly stream this in and whisk. I mix everything together cold and then put it over medium heat. And it looks totally liquid now, but it's going to thicken up quite a bit as I cook the flour. I'm whisking constantly. And so I'm going for a really thick paste so this is kind of like making caramel where it doesn't really look like anything's happening until it starts to happen. So just kind of sit here. So it's starting to thicken, which now it kind of has like a heavy cream consistency. Is it just because water's evaporating? It's the flour. It's the starches in the flour are thickening. So whisk constantly. And once you really start to see the bottom of the saucepan and the mixer doesn't fill it back in, that's when you're good. So this is what it looks like. So it's, I think, mainly known from Japanese milk bread, but it also occurred to me that like it's not dissimilar to Parashu, which you cook on the stove and is like a very soft dough and all the moisture in the dough is, you know, what's giving it this puffing action. So it's a really effective technique. And so I have this, you know, weird kind of flour mixture. I'm gonna scrape it into my stand mixer bowl. So we want this to cool off a bit. You don't really wanna mix a super hot dough, especially with the yeast. One of the ways that you cool something off is you get it out of the hot pan. I always work with active dry yeast in my recipes, principally because it's just very widely available. It's, you know, there's many other forms of yeast that work differently and work well, but this I think is just the most common and most accessible. So I'm gonna do one and a half teaspoons, which is half a tablespoon. Active dry yeast has this dehydrated coating around it that needs to be dissolved in liquid. One thing that happens is when you're making bread dough and you have, especially when you have a, like the hook and a stand mixer, the action of the hook working the dough around the sides of the bowl will eventually, with any amount of liquid in the dough, will dissolve the yeast on its own. And if you are confident that your yeast is alive, you can actually skip proofing 
and it's a technique of slowing down fermentation a little bit. I think there's a time and a place for proofing, but generally I skip it. Well, you're seeing a little bit of bubbling. I have some lumps of yeast in here, but I'm not worried about that because all of that mixing in the stand mixer will smooth out and dissolve the rest of the yeast. So now I'm gonna add my other wet ingredients. I have three eggs total, but only two are gonna go in the dough. One is for brushing over the rolls before I bake. The recipe calls for everything to be room temp. However, if your eggs are a little on the cold side, it's not a bad thing because it's gonna help cool down that flour mixture. So two eggs. Hold on to the third one for baking. Sour cream. It calls for room temp. I would say it's cool room temp, which again, it's a good thing. It's gonna help bring the temperature of everything down a little bit. I'm gonna add the sugar. This is a quarter cup of just granulated sugar. I'll add this salt to my bread flour. That'll all go in. So I'm gonna add my yeast mixture. Then I'm gonna turn on the mixer just on low, just to get everything kind of combined. And then I'll add my salt and flour and my butter. So I just want the eggs to break up a little bit. It's more or less mixed. I'm gonna add my dry ingredients. So the rest of that bread flour and salt. And I'm also gonna add some of the butter. I'm gonna add half to the dough, and the other half I save for the pan and for brushing over the dough at the end after they bake on the finished rolls. So I'm gonna put this on the lowest speed. The dough really benefits from a long, slow, extended mix that'll take upwards of five minutes or so. I'll come back and look at it and add a little more flour if needed if the dough seems sticky. At first it seems really dry, but then it quickly hydrates and becomes pretty sticky. So right now, the dough came together, it's gathered around the hook, but it's super shaggy and like not smooth and it's sticking in places. So I just wanna let this go. Don't turn up the speed. It's gonna slowly mix and we're gonna eventually have a really smooth, supple dough. And we do wanna periodically remove the dough from the hook, scrape down the sides just to make sure it's mixing evenly. My old pan had a coating on it that started to flake off. So I invested in a light colored aluminum pan, uncoated. These are super durable and will last for a long time. Metal is, in most cases, my preferred material for baking, specifically light colored aluminum, ideally anodized aluminum. It just creates even baking. It means that your rolls will get, develop a nice, beautiful exterior, but not be overcooked and everything will bake evenly. So I'm going to brush the bottom and sides of the pan with this butter, which is more or less room temp. I'm gonna use two tablespoons, which doesn't sound like a lot, but then you start to smear two tablespoons over the pan and you realize it is kind of a lot. So it's gonna be a very thick layer and that is what you want. And I don't need to line this. This doesn't get parchment paper. The rolls really just kind of lift right out of the pan. So the butter helps with its browning, its flavor, and it's also, you know, non-sticking. That is our pan. The rest of that butter and my brush get set aside for brushing the baked golden beautiful rolls at the end. Chives are these like little hollow, almost like grass-like tubes. Is it an herb? I think it's an herb, right? I don't know. What are chives? It's an onion. onion. It's in the onion family, it's an onion. right. It's an allium, but I mean, it's really used like an herb, but they have sort of a light onion flavor. They're really delicate. How hard is it to cut chives? Well, apparently there is quite a bit of technique here. The way that I like to do it is the way that I was taught, which is you slice a little bundle of chives in half, and then you take one half, flip it 180, set it next to a bundle around you, and that just means that you're starting with all like clean cut sides of the chives. And you wanna keep them in this little bundle, packed together, but you know, you don't wanna crush them. So I'm using my fingers to kind of keep everything tidy and together. You wanna slice through them because the point is that when you pick up a little tiny piece of cut chive, you want it to be a circle. You don't want it to be smushed and closed. This is why you need a sharp knife. Our chefs used to come around to culinary school and literally like pick up a chive and be like, ugh, you know, <laughs> like if they weren't not pleased with your slicing. And this is also why you don't want them to be wet because they'll stick together. So I'm gonna just transfer these over to my measuring cup. You wanna see circles, you see that? How they're not smushed together. So the point is to slice and not crush. I'm gonna fill up this half cup, which seems like it's gonna take forever, but this part goes pretty fast. It's a good way to practice some knife skills. So just remember, the main points are slice, not crush. So move through, not pressing down. 
dry chives, and a sharp knife. So I'm gonna take the dough out. I added like a tablespoon of flour, scraped on the sides, let it go, added another tablespoon, just to prevent lots of sticking, but the dough looks good. I would say that the dough is tacky, not sticky, so when I go like this, it doesn't stick to my hand. So I'm going to turn it out of the mixer and onto the surface. Before you let any dough rise, it's a good idea to form it into some kind of shape, whether it's around or something else where you've smoothed the dough over itself and that's just gonna give you a nice even rise where you can easily gauge you know, how much it's growing. I'm using this technique with the bench scraper, but all you can do have to do is really like gather the ends and squeeze them together so you have this kind of surface. Now I'm gonna dust it with a little bit of flour, just a very little amount. Then into a clean bowl. Usually I'll like get a separate bowl, but the mixer bowl is pretty clean. Maybe I'll give it a little dusting of flour in there. You're gonna put the dough inside. This gets covered and you are going to let it sit at room temperature until it has doubled in size. Depending on the temperature of your kitchen, it could take an hour and a half to two hours, maybe a little more, a little less if it's really hot or cold. I'm gonna put a cover on that. So I'm gonna set this aside but actually I made a batch of this dough last night and rather than letting it sit at room temp, I put it right into the fridge, but because the dough was warmed from that action of like the friction against the side of the bowl, it did rise overnight in the fridge. So I'm gonna get that out and we're gonna move right into incorporating the chives and forming the rolls. To prepare the rolls, I'm going to lightly flour the surface, very light, and I'm gonna grab the dough so this gently rose overnight, and it's really a nice convenience to be able to set up the dough the night before and then let it rise, and it also will improve the flavor. So as it's kind of rising slowly under cold temperature. So what I wanna do is just very lightly punch down the dough. You can see there's all these little bubbles on the surface. It's built up all these gases. So I'm going to, literally with a fist, just kind of knock out some of that gas. This I can turn out onto my floured surface. And because the dough is cold, it's gonna be easier to work with. So it would look a little bit different if I were using the room temp dough that just sat out on the counter and rose. But either way, it's not gonna be sticky. Once the dough really rests, the flour fully hydrates, it becomes pretty easy to work with. So to incorporate the chives, I didn't just like mix the chives into the dough as the hook was working it in the stand mixer because chives bruise really, really easily. And I wanna maintain like their freshness and the green color and everything. So I incorporate them at this stage. So you can press the dough down. I'm going to work it slash roll it into kind of a 12 inch square. It's always hard to get like a round thing into a square thing and vice versa. Go ahead and tug on the corners. Try to really square them off. You can also use the rolling pin to kind of give yourself some straight sides. The measurements aren't super important, but I'm about 12 by 12. I sliced every single last piece of chive I had and I only got more like a third of a cup, but that's okay. So I'm gonna sprinkle the chives evenly across the surface of the dough. Having them be dry is really important, otherwise they're not really gonna sprinkle. It's the same thing with like parsley, any herb. You don't really wanna cut any herb wet. So you can press them around. So we have active dry yeast in here and part of the logic behind punching down the dough, which is a thing we hear about yeasted dough, is that you are Knocking out the gas, of course, but you're also like refeeding the yeast. So the yeast generates carbon dioxide because it's feeding on the flour and you wanna bring it into contact with like fresh flour sources. So that's what that does. I'm going to fold up the dough and create, I'm kind of partly rolling it, partly folding it, but I wanna create a really loose kind of roll of the dough where I'm, I'm closing up the chives in the dough. If any fall out, just stick them back in. So here I have my loose roll, and now all those chives are incorporated. I'm gonna bring this back onto the surface and give it a little more flour. Now I'm gonna roll this out again, and here is where we form each little roll. I'm gonna use my rolling pin. I'm gonna roll it until I have something that's around 16 inches long and about six inches wide. This recipe makes quite a few rolls. I mean, they're really small. I think you could eat like a couple of them. So it makes 24 total. To avoid really tapered ends, I'm pushing the dough out from the center and then once I get to the end, I'm actually rolling in like a crosswise direction to then try to flatten it out and widen those tapered ends. Because the more even it is, the more even all of the rolls will be when I cut them. It's okay if it's not perfectly even though. Like I don't have totally straight sides. Now I'm gonna cut them. Should I use a bench scraper or should I use my, this guy? 
What do I use this Pizza. Guy? Pizza? Okay. To get 24 equal pieces, I'm gonna go lengthwise into thirds. So meaning like cutting it long ways into thirds. And then I'm gonna go crosswise into eight. <laughs> There we go. So I'm gonna start by going lengthwise. And I'm just, if I do like this, that helps me a little bit to make sure I'm doing it evenly. There's those chives. There's like layers of them. So that just means that the chives are gonna be evenly distributed throughout the rolls. And now I'm gonna go crosswise into eighths. So half, quarters, and then eighths. So let's look at a portion, I'll pull one from the middle, that has these sort of layers of chives incorporated throughout. And then when I form them into a circle, into a sphere rather, they're gonna be evenly distributed all the way throughout. I'm gonna take the corners, and there's kind of, both sides are nice and smooth, pick the smoother side, and I'm gonna pinch them together all in one spot. So I have this little like, it looks like a garlic clove or something like that, like a little bundle. So pinch all of those corners together. And the idea is to smooth the dough around itself and creating a nice surface. And once you do that, and the next step is to put it on your work surface. Now this dough is still a little bit cold, which is great because it means that it's not gonna start proofing. If your dough is on the warm side, you wanna try to work quickly at this point when it comes to forming them. But then again, you have 24, so it's a good idea to like maybe enlist a little help, an extra set of hands. So again, take you know the smoother of the sides and you're going to take the dough and stretch it around itself. So you're taking that surface of dough and creating this kind of cloak and pinching together all of the corners and sides until you have this little bulb shaped droplet. So go ahead and remove any flour from the surface because that's gonna inhibit this step. You're gonna take your little ball, pinched side down rounded side up, and then cup your hand around the dough. You're not really gonna like hold onto it tightly, but you wanna have your fingers and your palm in contact with the dough. You're gonna move it in little circles across the surface. And what this is doing is it is stretching that dough further over itself and also sealing the surface. You can see what happened is because I'm stretching that dough, I have now like little tiny pieces of chives poking out, which creates a really cool, it's like a little confetti on the surface and now all of those seams have sealed. And that's why you don't want a lot of flour. It's that friction with the surface that's gonna help you stretch and tighten everything up and seal. And that's one. So you can go ahead and place that in the pan. Now if you get really good, you can go two at a time. Two portions, clean work surface. I'm much better with my left hand than my right hand. So I'm gonna keep doing this. It's actually more efficient if you were to like form all of them into that little bulb shape and then do that dragging across the work surface. If you're working really slowly, you can pop them in the fridge so that they don't start to proof. And then we move on to the second rise. So I have all the rolls formed. I love the like speckled effect from the chives. You can see that I did not get them all totally uniform. That guy's a little small, that guy's a little big, but that's okay. So the, as they rise, they're gonna expand and kind of start to touch. And then when I bake them, they're gonna expand dramatically and you're gonna get these like little, like, like shoulder to shoulder, cute, really tall, beautifully domed golden dinner rolls. So I'm gonna cover these and let them rest at room temperature. They're gonna rise, this is the second rise, and I'm gonna let them rise until they are touching, nearly doubled in size, not quite, and then we'll do a little poke test. I'll show you what they look like when they're proofed. So to cover them, I have these things called proofing bags, and it's kind of like a professional tool. Bakeries use them, so I bought them on like a baking supply website. But it's better than plastic, so it, cre it creates a sealed environment for proofing, and it, they're reusable, so I like that a lot. See, it's this huge bag. It's really designed for fitting like a, a full sheet tray. I just have this smaller pan here, and I'm gonna stick this inside. And then obviously I have quite a bit of overhang, so I just kind of fold I'm just wrap it like a present. So I'm gonna let this proof and wait for them to have that like nearly doubled in size, really puffy, it'll be touching, and then we're gonna bake. 45 minutes to an hour later. Let's take a look. Depending on your pan, they might all be touching at this point. I'm gonna show you what they look like proofed. So you can see they've puffed, they've grown, they're all touching, they've gotten taller. So part of the reason for that forming that we did on the surface, that kind of dragging and stretching and tightening, is to give them this domed look so that when they rise in the oven, they rise up and not just out. 
I mean, they're going to rise up anyway because they're going to, you know, push into each other. But we just want the most pleasing, pretty, round, tight rolls. <laughs> Couldn't think of the word. So when I press my finger in, it's going to spring back, which is an indication that there's lots of air inside. It left a slight impression, which is what we want. Before we bake, and I have my oven on 350, which now that I said that, I'm gonna wanna verify that that is right. What's the position of the rack? Center. Center rack. Oh my God, 375. Turn that up a little bit. Center rack, 375. Okay, so I have my one remaining egg that I beaten, and you want it streak-free, like that kind of stringiness. So I have a clean pastry brush, and I'm gonna just lightly coat the surface of the rolls, and that's because the egg wash will make them super shiny and like kind of burnished looking and really golden brown. And these look so appealing when they're baked. And I'm just covering the surface because you don't have to really get down around the sides because they're just gonna bake together anyway. So now that I have the egg wash on there, I'm gonna to top it with a little bit of fresh black pepper and some flaky salt. But I'm just giving each one a little crack. Some flaky salt, not very much. So I'm on 375. These are gonna go in for 25 to 30 minutes. So we're just gonna bake until they are risen and the surfaces are deep golden brown and super shiny. And don't forget that you have a couple of tablespoons of butter left over and that's for brushing on top because as if they weren't rich enough, they get a little butter bath at the end. Okay, the rolls are done. Let's take them out of the oven. That went on the low end of the time range. That was like 25 minutes. So now right out of the oven, I'm going to brush the remaining two tablespoons of butter across the tops and the butter will just kind of absorb into the dough. And of course it's gonna give them this like beautiful shiny look. I really like the way the butter drips down the domes and settles into the little like cushiony area and then it kind of absorbs from there. These have to cool in the pan for about 10 or 15 minutes and then I'm going to unmold all of them together and then we can pull them apart and taste them. So as they cool, I'm gonna put lots of butter in the pan and they have pulled away a little bit from the sides of the pan. So. Really, they, nothing's really sticking. So all you have to do is get a spatula underneath and kind of slide them out. Let's talk about the rolls. They look really good and they smell delicious. They smell nice and chivey. I mean, I've made versions of these where I don't do chives, but I do like a garlic butter. I actually really, I prefer the chives. I think having that kind of mild onion flavor is really nice and it doesn't like compete too much if you're having it with, you know, with food at dinner. It's a great accompaniment to like soup and stew and braises and that kind of thing. I'm gonna pull one off. Even though they're really hot, I, I really don't wanna wait. Ooh. We have like a crispy texture around the sides and the top. Then you have like buttery, kind of soaked. Then you have super soft, pillowy, light, bready interior. I just love this texture. Can we see how it compares to the book? Oh yeah. That was pretty close to that. And then of course on the turn page, this has more, a little more salt or just like salt in larger pieces. There's like a very subtle tang from the sour cream, which I love. They're not overly yeasty. I mean, we let these sit, I let this just sit overnight. So it does develop the flavor, but mostly what you get is just kind of light, savory, oniony flavor from the chives, butter, a little bit of tang, and then combined with that is just the textural experience of it being so pillowy and light, delicious. Mm. It's not quite a project, like there's a couple steps and you, you, know, you do that little pre-cooked mixer on the stove, but the stand mixer does most of the work. I think it's a recipe that's fun to make, it's kind of a lot of learning, and then the payoff is still huge. You get 24 of like the softest, pillowiest, most delicious, savory dinner rolls, I feel like this would be the star of the meal no matter what you make. So I hope you try it out. Thank you for watching Dessert Person. Stay tuned for more episodes and like and subscribe.